Welcome to Routing for Success, the show where we interview today's top logistics professionals, giving them a platform to share their stories and best practices. Today, we are talking with one of the largest contractors in the service provider network today. Chad Carpenter operates 220 daily routes via his company, NEC Express. In this episode, we discuss Chad's background, first working for FedEx Express, and how he used the experience gained there to build one of the largest contractor fleets around 220 routes in only five years as a contractor. I am pleased to give you Chad Carpenter. All right, we are here with Chad Carpenter, NEC Express, 220 routes with FedEx Ground. Chad, thanks for meeting with us today. Yeah, good to be here. So we're going to talk all about your FedEx business. I think a lot of people listening are, are going to be very interested to know how the heck do you scale up to 220 plus routes with FedEx Ground. Before we get into all of that, tell us a little bit about yourself. What's your background? Um, well, um, I live just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. That's where I pretty much grew up. Um, I, uh, uh, upon getting out of school and, and I went to a local school here to play baseball. When, when I got out of school, I, I immediately went to work for uh, Federal Express uh, when I graduated from college. Uh, the plan was to, uh, you know, kind of grow into their management. And uh, as I started there, I was there 24 years before I, you know, left. But uh, when I started there, I went, I did everything at Express. I, uh, you know, started out driving and uh, ran Saturdays, had opportunity, went through their management training program, did that for, for quite a while and had opportunities to go into their management over there. But, you know, at heart, I always wanted to own my own business. So I, I actually started a, uh, a business, a mobile DJ business and I grew that into five, five mobile DJs that worked for me. So I did that along with FedEx for about, uh, 10 years. I sold that business, got into a little house flipping. Um, when the market turned in 2008, I went from the house flipping to property management because we had a lot of houses we were sitting on. So, you know, still at FedEx this whole time while I did this, I always been pretty busy, but you know, I had the, the DJ and then the house business and the rental property business. So, you know, I went back to FedEx uh, for a long time. The last 10 years at FedEx, I ran what they called the first overnight service. Just basically went in at six o'clock, went to the airport, picked up the really early time commit packages and maybe did eight or nine stops and was done for the day. So it allowed me chances to do other things. Um, but about 2018, I had I looked into FedEx ground around 13 or 14 and an opportunity was pr presented to me but at the time it was uh i thought it was overvalued for what i wanted to pay and uh, in 2018 in this area is when fedex integrated the uh home delivery to the ground that's when if you owned one area you had to own the other they went with the overlap so an opportunity presented itself to me in 2018 to to i was three zip codes right in the area where i live a uh, suburb of of, of uh, charlotte called gastonia area it was Actually, Dallas, Bester City, Kings Mountain, uh, six trucks. So uh, the guy who owned the ground and the guy who owned the home delivery, both were, were struggling and having some hard times. So I made a deal with them, took over those six routes. Uh, a month later, uh, picked up four more routes that those same guys had. And then um, three to four months later, picked up the additional 10 that they had. So. Uh, within six, seven months, I drew from six routes to right at 18 routes. And uh, that, like I said, that was in 2018. And then, uh, you know, just kind of grew here and there a little bit. And really in 22, a uh, year that I knew a lot of things were going to happen in the FedEx world. And, you know, it was a tough year for everybody, but I, I, a lot of opportunity came in 22. I, you know, I grew had a pretty good year in 21 growing and then 22, I picked up a good bit more and, uh, you know, it's just continued to, to grow. And, you know, there's been a lot of opportunities this year as well. So, uh, you know, I do, I do put managers in each location and, uh, it's worked out well. I want to come back and talk about your, your growth path, but before we do, so just to recap, uh, you did 20 plus years with FedEx express. And 24, yeah. 24 years with FedEx express. And, I'm sure that most of the people tuning into this podcast will know, but for the few people who don't, FedEx is really a combination of a few different companies all under one umbrella. So when you see a van going down the road that says FedEx Express, that van is owned by FedEx Corporation and the driver is employed by FedEx. It's all corporate controlled. 
When you see a truck driving down the road that says FedEx ground, on the other hand, that truck is not owned by FedEx and the driver driving it is not employed by FedEx. The truck is owned by and the driver is employed by an independent contractor or independent service provider. Uh, you know, there's just ballpark, about 5,000 of them across the country who operate a pretty big fleet of vehicles. And um, so usually there isn't really any overlap between the companies. You might talk to someone who, you know, started out with FedEx ground and became a FedEx ground contractor. You might talk to someone who worked at Express, but you actually worked at Express 24 years, developed that experience in logistics, and then you switched over to contracting. You did a few other things too, mobile DJ business. That's pretty interesting. I'd like to ask you more about that. But um, how did that experience help you? So, you know, again, what were you doing in Express and do you feel like it served you to help you learn the business and make you more successful as a contractor for ground? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like I said, I started out, my plan was, you know, uh, to, to go into their management program. But as I did that, you know, I learned back then that was in 94. They didn't, uh, you know, the managers at Express didn't make a whole lot of money. So I was actually making a good bit more money as a, as a courier and at, at doing what I did on the side. So I elected not to do that and moved into some other things. But yeah, I mean, at Express from that point on, I, I uh, actually, that was before GPS. That was before Google. Uh, that was before any ground cloud or anything like that. I mean, we actually went in and we had a map book and you had to line, you know, you sorted your truck and you had to line the stops up with a map book. Uh, so we did that. And but what, you know, FedEx evolved over the years, obviously, but I kind of saw the writing on the wall back then that, you know, with the internet and online shopping, that everything was going to be more, uh, I thought the ground had the biggest area to grow. And, you know, with, with FedEx Express, it was people sometimes think it's a lot of freight. I mean, I, I could take in the operation that I run in the Charlotte area, I could take the whole building that we did in our express build, um, the volume and put it on my trucks and never even know I have it. I mean, the freight is, is obviously it fits into a, a, a small van most of the time, most of the routes. Their routes are doing on average, I would say, between 70 to 90 stops, you know, and, but the, the thing most people don't realize is one FedEx Express route, you know, we probably have three to four ground routes in that same area. So they're very spread out versus what we are. So, you know, if I took 90 trucks off a of FedEx Express route and I put it on four of my trucks, we're talking about 20, 25 stops that more than likely we're already going to or we're going right beside and take up you know, very, very little room. So it's, it's, uh, it's going to be something that I think that we can take over very easily. Uh, you know, a lot of people are concerned about the time commit. I, I don't think that's going to be an issue because most of the time commit stuff is, is in the business sector where it's hospitals, doctor's offices, uh, lawyer's offices, stuff that's in tight that our routes are already going to by the time committed anyway. You know, the bigger scale would probably be that they do uh, same day pickups, you know, you call in and say, I got to pick up. You got to basically got to have an hour window. But I don't even consider that to be much of a challenge because, like I said, we do have drivers and they're very they're very tight right now. And most of the time those pickups are in, you know, high, you know, in town, you know, business type stuff. So we already got drivers right around there anyway. So I, I don't see it. being. I think it's going to be a, a plus for us. And, uh, you know, when it's all said and done, I think hopefully uh, it'll be more money for everybody. You know, that's really interesting because you have that background with Express. So you really understand that business at a deep level uh, that most other people probably don't. I've spoken with a lot of contractors who are frankly concerned about the Express and ground integration. Uh, you know, I've spoken with people who view it as an opportunity who say, hey, if it's more volume, send it my way. I'll figure out a way to make money from it. I've spoken with other people who say, I, you know, they're, you know, I don't know if it's going to pay well enough to justify sending someone out. Uh, you know, really to run an inefficient route so they can go way out of their way to make a specific pickup time. Chad, it sounds like you're not concerned about that at all. That it sounds like those, you know, a hard 9 a.m. pickup time. You're probably in the area anyway. Your driver's in the area anyway. No, I'm not 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 concerned at all. I mean, most it's, it's, you're kind of it's very rare. I mean, I, I don't think I ever saw a 9 a.m. pickup time. Normally, it's like somebody calls in at two o'clock and they want to pick up between two thirty and three thirty, uh, which, you know, like I said, we have drivers out there. I don't, I don't see it being an issue uh, for, for most people as contractors. 
we are pretty nimble when it comes to uh, making changes that FedEx requires us to make. And I think this is just another one. But hopefully, I think this is going to be a very beneficial one to us and, and to FedEx of a company. Um, I mean, there's just a, I mean, when you look at taking all those vehicles off the road, all those people, all those, uh, the workers cop, the gas, the truck payment, everything that FedEx has, you know, now they're basically getting rid of it and just putting it on us. I mean, just it's something that we can handle fairly easy. Chad, let's come back to your your path to growth. And I do want to talk about your operations and your business today, some of the things that you're doing to run good operations, especially for one that's so spread out and so big, um, you know, 220 plus routes. But let's go back to your growth. So you started in 2018. So you've only been in the FedEx contractor game for about five years at this point here in August of 2023. Um, tell us, let, let's walk through in a little bit more detail. How did you come across the opportunities to grow were you mostly purchasing the rights to CSAs from other contractors or were you able to find opportunities to grow for, you know, less money out of pocket? What did that look like? Yeah, mostly it was, uh, I purchased pretty much everything. Most of the time it was people who were, who were either struggling and you know, needed to get out fairly quickly or so, some of the locations where, you know, they built a new building and they were moving somebody's half of somebody's operation to a new building and the contractor didn't want to go into both buildings. So, you know, they, they would sell at a, a really good price just to not have to deal with all the movement. Um, and, and sometimes it was just when I'm in a building, opportunity presents itself and I'm able to grow from there. Uh, but, you know, just really looking at a lot of the websites, you know, I've dealt with some brokers and a lot of people just have reached out to me that, you know, in an area they know I look to grow and um, had opportunity, you know, I, I operate from Charlotte, uh, you know, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, and Florida. Kind of, so kind of all in the Southeast, you know, I had an operation in Virginia, uh, and Soviet. I, I like to stay North Carolina and, and South, I say. So that's kind of my key areas. You know, I love the Florida state and, uh, you know, a lot of growth in Florida, just a lot of over the last couple of years, it's, it's been a challenging environment, as everybody knows. So there's been a lot of opportunity. People just sometimes want to cut their losses and move on. And that's kind of where I, you know, I, I focus on those type operations. Chad, what do you think has allowed you to, I mean, I mean everything that you're saying right now, nothing is, is like groundbreaking to me. I mean, it sounds uh, not, not that it's easy stuff but it's not super complicated. You know, I've had other people come onto this podcast and talk about a lot of the same concepts, you know, keep an eye out for opportunities. If there's someone struggling, you can get them out of their business, you know, on the cheap or maybe even for free, take over the area, but scaling up to 220 plus routes, very few people do that. What do you think has allowed you to grow your business to the scale that it, it, it's at today? Well, like I said, I've been fortunate with the opportunities that presented themselves. You know, I've had, uh, I've had some managers that, I train in, in house here in Charlotte and I've been fortunate enough where they've been willing to move. So I've been able to move managers to most locations that I go. I've inherited some managers that I've kind of trained myself and set the expectations. But, you know, the difference between what I do and what everybody else does, I mean, it's the same. I mean, trucks and people are the two main things. And, you know, I try to treat my people as good as I can treat them. Uh, I know a lot of your people that come on say the same thing, but uh, that, that's really the key for me to, to being able to grow and, and retain good employees. Uh, the employee part is one that, you know, we try to offer as much as we can offer and pay benefits and retirement to, you know, my whole thing is I, I'm trying to create a lot of people say these are just jobs, but I'm trying to create more of a career than I am a job, uh, for, for the guys that work for me. Uh, I think we have to, in order to grow, in order to, to keep succeeding as a company, uh, FedEx and us, we, we have to be able to, to provide careers, which is. You know, decent pay, give raises, give benefits, give vacation, all that stuff is, is necessary. And, you know, I do that. And, you know, it's hard to do that sometimes in this environment. It's hard to pay what we need to pay. It's hard to give raises. And, you know, I have to take a lot less. But, you know, as you're a little bit bigger, if you can make a little less on each operation and, and uh, you know, it, it adds up. Uh, it's just the, the, the biggest thing is to not have a losing operation. And sometimes in this environment, it, that's that's a hard thing. Because contracts do vary, you know, some, some contracts are good, some are bad. And I think, uh, you know, the bad ones are hard to overcome and, you know, that's, that's part of it. But, uh, as far as the growth goes, I, I'm kind of pretty picky about where I go. It's gotta be, I look for high growth areas. 
and uh, the areas that I've been able to pick up are all high growth. And so, you know, it may start out at 10 routes and you know, it jumps to yeah, over time, you know, 15 routes. So, and I think that's going to continue to grow. I, I don't necessarily think that the express volume is going to make it, but I just think there's going to be a lot of opportunity, a lot of growth over the next couple of years, regardless of what, what the economy does. So, Chad, you talked about how some contracts are profitable and, and viable as a business opportunity, but some of them aren't. Have you had any opportunities come across your desk that you looked at and just said, no, you know, I don't, I don't think that I'll be able to make enough money going into this Oh, absolutely. Uh, this contract? absolutely. I mean, there's certain areas, and I think the, the calculations that FedEx uses are off sometimes in certain areas, especially uh, uh, really high volume um areas that are that are tight but a lot of cubic volume uh i don't think sometimes you can come out on that just that we don't the package is between what you have to pay and you know at the end of the day i just don't think there's anything left so yeah i think it has to be a uh an area that has high growth potential particularly what i've seen in the residential areas um you know and they always say there's more money in ground but i i don't see that myself i think there's more money in the residential aspect. Chad, what are some other things that you look for? You've talked about, you know, cubic capacity as one metric that you look at. You've talked about just the overall market being a high growth area. What are some other things that you look for when you're looking at an opportunity? Well, I look at the the terrain of the area for one. I mean, I, you know, I like areas that have a lot of growth potential. I like areas that are not uh, real mountainous that, you know, you have to deal with snow. I, I I don't want to operate in snow. It's a, obviously a safety issue and uh, ice, any of that. I don't want to have to deal with. I don't want to have to worry about, you know, terrain that's very rough on trucks or the maintenance is, is crazy high. Uh, so all that plays a part. You know, I don't really want to deal with areas that have, you know, mile long driveways, a bunch of them or gated communities uh, that, you know, there's a lot of different things. I, I don't want to have to deal with the downtown Charlotte or downtown Chicago. I mean, some people do, but, that's not something I want to entertain. You know, safety is kind of the biggest deal for all of us. And, you know, in those those downtown areas where there's not much parking and people don't care, it's just too easy to have uh, accidents, in my opinion. You know, it's just hard to find that perfect fit. So I like a good combination of of quickness with, with a little bit of rural. I mean, that's that's kind of my what I look for. And then what about the contract aspect? I mean, you know, a lot of people, especially newer people coming into this business, you know, maybe they don't have a background and they're still learning the ropes and a contract slides across the desk and they're supposed to look at it and determine, is this viable? Can I make money uh, with, with this contract or which, which option do I go with? You know, if a few different options are presented, how did you learn how to do that? And do you have a process around it? Well, kind of my big thing, and it comes from express is learning how to set up routes, you know, DRO. I do a lot with DRO. Uh, I'm a believer in I put the biggest truck in the area that it, it can handle and I maximize that truck. So I try to run really efficient and run as few trucks as possible. You know, I do have to, uh, in a lot of areas run behind, you know, sometimes I have to put two trucks in an area. If I have to run an IC route, which is an incompatible route, which, uh, you know, everybody in the business knows what that is. It's big freight that you know takes up too much room in the truck. So I typically do run an IC route, uh, in an area, one or two behind the routes, just because it, you, you have in order to do the stops that I like my routes to do, which typically between 150 and 200 stops in high growth areas, sometimes 250. And it's hard to imagine doing 250 stops. But, you know, I do have drivers that do 250 to 300 stops, which is I mean, you're talking about getting out, you don't you know, almost a stop a minute for all day long. <laughs> I mean, it's it's you know, the guys work. Yeah, I, I, I've done what they did when when I started out. Um you know, I, I ran the operations, I ran a route or two every day and I managed it myself. And, you know, I did that uh, up until about a year and a half ago. I, you know, I did whatever it took to, to grow. And as I put my managers in place, they do a great job, but they know that that's their job. You know, if, if things go wrong, things go good. A BC has got a great day. They come in and get them out and they're just kind of monitoring. But if things go bad, they're expected to be out there until the freight gets delivered. So, uh, you know, providing the customer service and, you know, at express where I came from, that was kind of the whole thing over there was their PSP philosophy, as they call it, people service philosophy, profit, you know, treat your people well, 
they'll give you the service you need to make a profit. And that's kind of the way I, I, I look at things and I try to, to run my businesses similar to that. Now, Chad, you've referenced a few times to the environment that we found ourselves in in 2022 and so far this year in 2023. I've had lots of people tell me that it's been a particularly challenging time to be in the package delivery business. Costs are rising. Um, what are some specific things that you've implemented in your business that you feel like have enabled you to save money over the past 18 months? Well, I mean, as an operator, really, if you get down to the the, the only thing that we can control uh, to an extent is our payroll. I mean, you know, we, we our insurance is what it is. Our gas kind of is what it is. I mean, you can, you know, you can cut the truck, obviously cut your truck off, don't idle it and that, that. but really at the end of the day, our, our payroll is it. So, you know, you have to minimize the routes that you send out. And uh, it's very tough because, you know, if we had past, if we had data that, was 100% accurate, it would be easy. But obviously, with, you know, we don't, our projections aren't always 100% accurate. So, you know, if you could armchair quarterback today for yesterday, I could probably save, you know, at least a route. But not having that exact data that we need, you still kind of have to go on historical data, you know, more, you know, what did last Monday do versus uh, what does DRO say it's going to do, you know. I think it, the, the key is is knowing what your historical data is week over week and basing your plans off of that historical data versus the projection that you may get on DRO. Uh, you know, and you try that and, and, you know, run the routes, plan the routes accordingly and try to try your best to send as few routes on the road as possible. And, you know, a lot of people believe in, in you know, running a lot of routes with fewer stops, uh, paying less. You know, I, most of my drivers make really good money, but, you know, they work. They work hard and uh, they deserve what they get. And But I'm able to save by not sending an extra truck and not paying that gas and so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, that makes so much sense. I mean, if you think about if you've got a CSA with just call it 10, 10 routes and, you know, each driver, just call it 2,000 hours a year, if, if you gouge them for a dollar an hour, well, that's, you know, $2,000 per driver over the course of a year that you're saving or $20,000 over the course of the year that you're saving. Or if you can just figure out how to operate more efficiently, take a driver off the road. I mean, how much does that save you over the course of $50,000? Would that save you, you know, give or take? Um, and, and then you're not, you know, having to gouge people all the right. time if you can figure out how to run more efficiently. So that makes sense. Um, Chad, tell us a little bit about how your business is structured today. So you'd mentioned 220 routes. How many CSAs is that? Um, I think it's under uh, around 12 different CSAs. Uh, okay. I have different different company names and different different areas that we operate under. Uh, but like I said, I, I, I put a manager in each location and, and my managers know that they are responsible for making sure that we are successful. Uh, so when they go into a location, uh, they know that if they have to run, if things go bad and they have to run two routes, they run two routes. Um, you know, that's that's the only way I can do what I do um, is to to be able to have, you know, I still am very involved. You know, I, I, I still as AO, I still have to talk to FedEx. I still have to answer to FedEx. I still have to go through the metals meetings and things like that and make sure that we are, you know, gold or silver. That's where we need to be. And, you know, I, I put a lot on the managers. I train them that way though. And, and they, they come through for me. They do a great job. I mean, that's, that's the key. If, if you're an AO who's not in there every day, you have got to have uh, a manager that treats it like it's his business. I mean, it's easy to be a BC if you don't care about labor and you just bring in two extra people and, you know, you're going home every day at eight o'clock. But to have a BC that runs the operation like you would and make sure that they hit those uh, labor uh, projections that you've told them to hit and still run a good service number, that, that's the key. You know, when you're when you're running a smaller operation in this business, you do everything. I mean, you had mentioned that you were driving out on the route. You're the AO. You're the BC. You're handling the dispatch. You're you know handling DRO, payroll. You know, especially for small businesses, you do everything. As you scale, that's just not possible, right? You don't have 220 drivers blowing up your cell phone every day, you know, right. talking about issues. Tell uh, So you mentioned you have BCs. Tell us a little bit more about how your organization is structured. So obviously you're at the top. 
uh, you know, and then there's uh, drivers. Uh, tell us about everything in between. So you have BCs, one per station. Do you have any other support staff to help? Yeah, uh, um, obviously, you know, I'm where I am. And then underneath me, I have a, what I call my district manager. He and basically I say district, it's the whole Southeast. He, he is over, he is over all the BCs, you know, they report to him uh, with any issues they have, anything they need. He helps them. He basically travels around the whole Southeast and does whatever anybody needs. Uh, but, you know, like I said, we're very fortunate. We, we do uh, have good BCs. So we try to limit, you know, he trains them. We together, we train a new location and we train the manager how we want them to be trained and, a, you know, set those expectations. And I have, uh, you know, obviously I have a payroll lady who does the payroll. I have a recruiting lady. Uh, she does all my recruiting and runs people through the first advantage system and gets them approved. You know, I have trainers that train, um, uh, you know, that have the trainer trainer program trained it through ground cloud that we have to run all our drivers through. Um, so safety is a big thing, you know, uh, my district manager, he's also my safety guy. He preaches safety, uh, number one in all our operations, trying to make sure that that's where we lose a lot of money as well with, with accidents, with, you know, the FedEx charges us for accidents. They charge us, uh, you know, uh, above and beyond that in schedule, uh, L I believe it is where they, they take more money from our settlement. If we, so obviously, uh, you know, FedEx loses money. We lose money. Everybody loses money with accidents. So, but it is a kind of a, uh, hierarchy, if you will. You know, I'm the top and then my district manager and then all the BCs. I have a main BC in every operation, and then kind of an assistant BC uh, slash lead driver in every operation that kind of, because most of the operations that I have are seven day. Um, and, you know, seven days, you kind of got to have somebody other than the main man. So, uh, you know, most of them have a, a lead manager and kind of an assistant to cover when they're on vacation or on days that they're not there. Chad, you talked a little bit about having really good people in place for that BC position and how important that is to run a good organization. How do you find those people? Well, uh, you know, the, the, the manager that most of them originated in Charlotte with me and, uh, you know, I train them, you know, they're, they're people that are willing to move. Um, I train them. They, they start out training in Charlotte under, you know, my BC there and we train them to, to do all the things that a BC has got to do in his own operation, you know, from, from, you know, dealing with FedEx to, to doing the code 85s to, you know, answering, working with FedEx hand in hand on all the questions you have to answer every morning from FedEx uh, about packages, um, uh, from keeping the trucks, uh, maintained from keeping them service to, uh, you know, following up with our vetter KIs to doing our safety training. You know, there's a whole list of things that BCs do and we train them on what to do here in Charlotte and then, you know, move them to wherever. And, and, and in a certain sense, a couple of instances, I picked up a BC in an operation that continue to run it, but we just go down there and we train them there in the way that we expect them to, you know, to do things or the way that, you know, there's a way that some people are used to doing it and then they got to learn the way we do it. So we know that it's done right. And do the BCs handle uh, the route optimization you talked about, you know, Hey, if you can get one van off the road, it can make all the difference to your profitability. Is that something that you largely handle for your entire business or do your BCs handle? Well, initially when we go in, we, we, we normally redo the existing DRO and we try to, you know, run it as, as best as we can with the input from as many people as you know, typically you're inheriting some drivers, you know, some good, some bad, but we try to meet with them and, and redraw the DRO so it's, you know, at maximum capacity uh, and, and put as few routes on the road as we need to. And most of the time that takes, you know, it takes several months to tweak that from beginning to get it right where it needs to be. And, and you know, sometimes you have to, it does take a while in a new operation because, you know, drivers may be used to doing 80 stops. You know, I took an operation in Tennessee, for example, um, the, the contractor was running 20 routes a day and he had all old U-Haul trucks that had been converted to FedEx trucks, like 12 foot box trucks. Uh, He's running 20 routes. You know, we went in and we cut it. We put 11 P 1200s in there. It was a very tight area. And we put about 180 average stops on each truck. So a lot of those people couldn't do the 180 stops. You know, we had to find people, that could do the routes that we needed to be done. And, you know, we cut the routes from 20 to 11 though, 
Uh, so that's what needed to be done. And, you know, it, it took a while to get the right crew in there because, you know, not everybody can do 180 stops. It's a very tough jobs, physical, it's hard on the body. I mean, you know, it's for somebody that loves to work out or, you know, it, it's a perfect, I always tell people it's a, you know, it's a CrossFit workout because it really is. I mean, you're getting out in and out 180 pound, times a day carrying a average, you know, 20, 25 pound box. That's interesting. So what did you do with those drivers? Did they just have to go find something else or were you able to move them to like a rural route? Well, most of the time and that like in that particular situation, I mean, obviously we give them the opportunity to, to do what they need to do, but most of the time they end up, uh, you know, kind of leaving on their own accords. They just say, Hey, I can't, I can't do this. And, you know, and that particular operation, that's all we had was quick stuff. We didn't have any rural. It was just an area that was very, very tight. You know, it was all neighborhoods pretty much. And uh, the, it, you could easily go out there and average 25 to 35 stops an hour, depending on how fast they, you know, the drivers were. I mean, it took a while, but there are drivers who, who can do it. And who it, it just allows us to pay them more. They make more money, you know, and in turn, we make more money by sending less trucks. So for the other FedEx contractors listening to this, I feel like a big takeaway is think about efficiency. You know, look at your organization. Are you using the right trucks for the right sorts of routes? What can you do just to reduce the number of vehicles and number of people that you have out there working every day? That's the number one thing to focus on, it sounds like. Well, like I said, I mean, the, the only thing we can control is labor for the most part. I mean, that's the biggest thing that we, our biz, biggest expense is labor. And I would say, you know, gas and truck maintenance are right there behind that. So, you know, the fewer trucks you send on the road, the less truck maintenance you have. And, you know, the less gas you have, obviously. So, um, but, you know, I know I, one of your other podcasts, he had a guy that was very rural. I can't remember him, but he, he drove box trucks. And that works for him because he, he's very rural. He said it, his drivers can only do 60 or 70 stops. Well, obviously, a P1200 wouldn't be efficient in his operation. It's really, you have to look at the area you're in, you know, what's the best truck. You know, in the Chattanooga example I just mentioned to you, um, the the best truck for the route was a P twelve hundred because it's all neighborhoods. You know, it was no mountainous rural. If it was rural area in the mountains, obviously a P twelve hundred wouldn't work. So you kind of got to know your area. You got to know the terrain, and then go from there. So Chad, let's talk about the other uh, parts of the business. I guess a little bit of a rapid fire. Uh, you know, fuel card. What do you use for a fuel card? Um, I actually use a company called Fuel Z, uh, is what I use. And, uh, you know, I've looked into, uh, there's a, there's another card or a route consultant has a new card that I'm looking into, but, uh, Fuel Z is, is what I use and I've been pretty happy with them. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of controls you can put on the cards and you're able to cut them on and off with a push of a button, which makes it easy. So, uh, and they pretty much take them everywhere. So that makes it easy. Vetter system. Vetter, I'm a ground cloud man. I, uh, you know, I have 200 plus ground cloud units, uh, 200 plus iPads and all that. You know, ground cloud is kind of an all in one system. When I first started, I used a company called Package Route and Velocitor. But, you know, over time, the all in one concept of ground cloud just makes things really easy. Uh, you can do all your training. You can do your, you, you know, your coaching, your vetter. Uh, your monthly maintenance, your scheduling, your, I mean, you can do it all. So it just makes it very, very easy. Um, you know, you can do the clock in, clock out on the iPads and um, it's, it's really easy uh, to, to manage with that, um, with their, with their whole system. Payroll system. Payroll? Mm -hmm. Did you say payroll? Yes. Yeah. Payroll system. What do you use? Yeah. Um, like payroll? I said, I do have a payroll lady who goes, who goes, but we use ADP. ADP does uh, all our, all our payrolls. Uh, she enters, uh, that information into the into ADP and they handle it from there. You know, ground cloud is, uh, adding that addition. So that may be something I look at. I know they they just rolled that out where they're going to start doing payroll. So, uh, maybe something that I integrate into the, the system. What about insurance? Insurance, I actually, uh, I use a company out of uh, Simpsonville, South Carolina. It's called KLT Risk Insurance. Um, 
they have saved me a lot of money on workers comp and um, our employment liability and our general liability on our trucks that, you know, I basically buy new trucks for the most part. So we have to have insurance on those and they've been able to save me a tremendous amount of money uh, just through workers comp uh, and, and the insurance. It's, it's been a good fit. What about tires? Where do you get your tires from? I have a, a mechanic locally that he does a lot of people's, but you know, I'll work with him specifically. Um, he does all my maintenance in the, in the, uh, greater Charlotte area for me. He's got like 12 guys that work for him. And, you know, I know a lot of people, my size can benefit from their own, uh, guy, but you know, he and I have a pretty good relationship where I'm able to get a really good deal. And it's kind of like my own mechanic, even though it's his own company, it's not mine, but works out well for me. I, I mean, I could definitely could save some money if I, you know, if I had a warehouse full of tires and bought truckloads at a time, but then yeah, it, it involves other things, look, logistics of getting tires from one place to another, having somebody to do it. Just another headache that, you know, I choose to, it works out well for me the way I've got it worked out. Um, you know, I, I typically have a, a maintenance guy that kind of, you know, I'm big enough in, in every location where I can kind of get them to do my stuff and, and prioritize it. Now, what about the maintenance and fleet management piece? How do you keep track of when your oil changes are due and everything else? That's another uh, task I put on the BCs. The BCs work with the mechanic hand in hand. You know, they make sure that, the, and of course, the drivers as well. You know, they're making sure the drivers are doing a pre-trip every day, making sure we've got oil and all the fluids are topped off, all the blinkers. You know, the pre-trip, post-trip is something that we have to hold our drivers accountable for because obviously if they don't tell us it's missing a marker light or missing a blinker or the windshield wiper doesn't work, we don't know it. So, you know, typically they they text at the end of the day if something's wrong with the trucks to the BC and the BC works hand-in-hand -hand with the mechanic to make sure, you know, all the trucks are on a typically a, uh, about a three-week, a three-month cycle of, uh, you know, oil changes and preventive maintenance and all that where they go through and and then we go, the, the BCs go through once a week and just make sure all the, all the fluids are topped off. Uh, so, you know, stand on top of the brakes before, before they get into the rotors, you know, let the, make sure the drivers know to let the BC know, Hey, my, my, you know, my, my brakes are squeaking or so we can change the path before we have to change the rotors and calipers and all that. So it's just staying on top of it before something bad happens. Chad, are there any other products or services that you use in your business that you feel like have made an impact? No, I mean, like I said, ground cloud is pretty much the, the all in one thing that we use that have, has made life a lot easier for us. Uh, yeah, even when I first started in 2018 at FedEx ground, there, there was very few you know, the routing software like package route ground cloud. They were just getting started. So it wasn't nearly as good as it is today. Um, but with, with that addition and, you know, and with DRO, DRO has helped a lot, you know, since we started doing DRO and, you know, they've made a lot of enhancements to it. So we're able to cut routes and, you know, make LP routes, which is large package routes, or, you know, a lot of people use, uh, small ATV routes, which I don't personally, but a lot of people do. So that DRO is a great tool that, you know, enables us to do a lot. So Chad, you've been in this for about five years. You've built up one of the largest P&D organizations within the FedEx Ground Network that exists today. I mean, you're certainly within the top 1% of contractors. Where do you go from here? Are you planning to build this thing up and sell it and exit and go do something else at some point? Are you staying in for the foreseeable future? Where do you go from no, here? No, I mean, I, you know, my, my plan, you never know, but my plan is to continue. I, I like what I do. Um, yeah, I've got it set up pretty good now. I've got a good system in place. Um, I like dealing with what we deal with. I like, uh, I, I, you know, and everything that I thought was going to happen at FedEx when I started FedEx has happened. You know, I, I thought that uh, the companies would integrate and it would be all in one. I think that's happening. I think it's going to happen a lot. And, you know, the next year, 20, I think after Christmas, we'll see a lot of movement in that direction to move the express to the ISPs. Uh, I think it's going to be a great thing. You know, I think, I think the UPS contract is going to allow FedEx to pick up a lot of business. Um, you know, I think e-commerce is going to get better. I think, you know, I think the, the future is bright in the FedEx world. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking to expand even more and uh, with, with the right deal. 
Um, but you know, it's got to be the right deal. It's got to fit. It's got to check all the boxes, you know, and, and those are, those are, uh, few and far between, but when they're happening, you just got to be ready for them. So that's the key. Chad, is there anything else you want to talk about while we're here and you have this platform? Uh, no, I mean, I, I know there's a lot of frustration out there. I mean, obviously it's been a tough two years. Um, but you know, in my personal opinion, I went to the meeting. We had, a, obviously everybody knows we had a meeting in Florida, um, that everybody was invited to. It was a great meeting. I think uh, I came out of there positive. I think FedEx is listening to what we're saying. And I hope that, um, uh, I hope they're going to act from, you know, my, my perception of the meeting was that, you know, they wanted to do things and that um, they were going to listen to us. They were going to be transparent and they were going to make the changes that need to be made. I think they are aware that the last two years have been tough on people. It's been tough on me. I mean, I, I don't make it sound like it hasn't been. It's been a tough two years. Uh, it's tough right now. Um, but I, I do believe it's going to get better. I think, uh, as, as the cycle goes, maybe it's been in their favor the last couple of years with, with profit margins or whatever. But, you know, um, you know, if the, if people are struggling and you got one of those bad contracts, I would just say, keep, keep plugging away and, and with FedEx, letting them know and show them your expenses, uh, putting that expense uh, report together, show them all your expenses and compared to your settlement and say, Hey, you know, some, something's not right, you know, and try to try to get it to where, where you can at least make a little bit of money. I mean, in most operations, if you're just an owner operator, you can definitely make some money. If you go in there and run it yourself and, uh, you know, cut out a BC and you're the BC, you can, you can make it. But, you know, sometimes doing what I do, it becomes a little more hard to make profit when you're paying uh, the layers of people that I have to pay. Uh, but you know, if you're a smaller operation, I would say just get your, you know, get your hands dirty and get in there and do it. And, uh, you know, if people know, if your employees know you're willing to do it, most of the time, I think they, uh, they're willing to do a little bit better job for you anyway, um, versus you just tell them to do it. So that Chad, would be all thank I you for say. coming onto the podcast. I appreciate your time. Yes, sir. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Routing for Success is brought to you by AP Equipment Financing. In today's competitive market, it is essential to acquire the right trucks at a fair price and finance them in a way that makes sense for your business. Leveraging their extensive network of truck and van suppliers, the experts at AP Equipment Financing will help you locate the best deals on step vans, cutaways, panel vans, and more. Deliver them straight to your facility and finance them with low monthly installment options. Click the link in the description or visit APFinancing.com for more information. Routing for Success is an independent production of AP Equipment Financing and is in no way affiliated with or endorsed by FedEx Corporation, FedEx Ground, Amazon, or any other logistics company discussed herein. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Routing for Success.